Once Lyme disease crosses the blood-brain barrier, not only does it debilitate memory, your ability to speak and have a conversation, but it completely debilitates brain function in all areas. Life is worth living. And if you're not going to give up, then the only thing to do is to push forward. Everyone has something they deal with. It's okay to say your struggles. Want to be happy? Build a life, not just a business. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and this channel was created to help you overcome the number one challenge that is holding you back, a lack of belief in yourself. You watch these videos because you know there's something more inside you too. You've got Michael Jordan level genius at something. So today let's live your best belief life and learn how you can cope with Lyme disease. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one. Be a warrior with Ali Hilfiger. When I was seven years old, my family took a little vacation somewhere on the East Coast. I don't remember if it was the Hamptons or Nantucket or, you know, one of those cute little towns. And the only souvenir that I came back with on that vacation was a seemingly insignificant tick bite right here on my tummy. So my mother took the tick off with a little pair of tweezers, put it into a plastic bag, sent it off to be tested. And actually, her precaution and education at the time was pretty advanced for a woman, a mother living in the 90s. So the test came back, negative, inconclusive, borderline. Ultimately, I went undiagnosed and untreated. So this was due to a major failure in the testing protocols at the time, which sadly have not improved to this day, as well as doctors who did not know what to look for. Little did I know, the tick was carrying two very debilitating diseases, Lyme disease and Babesiosis, which is like the cousin to malaria. So you can imagine how terrible that is. And what many people don't know about Lyme disease is that it can cause manic and psychotic episodes, just like the ones I experienced, or the one that I experienced. Once Lyme disease crosses the blood-brain barrier, not only does it debilitate memory, your ability to speak and have a conversation, but it completely debilitates brain function in all areas. So you end up looking like a crazy bag lady. A psychiatrist in the hospital connected all of the dots, and she suspected that I might be dealing with untreated Lyme disease. I told her there was no way. Although all of my previous Lyme tests had come up as inconclusive or negative, she still demanded that I go see another doctor. So I went. The blood results came back. The results were through the roof. My body was riddled with Lyme disease and Babesia. Now, I felt like I had won the lottery. I really did. I thought, oh my gosh, the cure is upon me. I can take an easy course of antibiotics and done. I had no idea there was no cure for long-term Lyme disease. No idea. The diagnosis was just one little element of the process. So once I had this diagnosis, which took 11 years, many false negative results, a nervous breakdown, I was put on a very aggressive course of antibiotics, horse pills, baskets of them. And I would take them, and I would have a major flare-up called a Herxheimer, and I'd get a lot worse before getting better. So six to nine months of being on these treatments, I finally, finally felt like I could take on the world, that I could go back out there and prove to myself and others that I could still work hard, and I could make up for lost time only to find myself crashing and burning months later. This became a cycle of ups and downs, relapsing, feeling better, thinking I was better, then relapsing all over again. You can imagine the frustration and disappointment. I was on this roller coaster for seven years. I had an IV in my arm into my heart for seven months. Traveling between Europe and New York, Attaching the IV on a hanger, I had to make a decision. Do I want to live or 
Do I want to die? You know, I had this vision of myself possibly one day having a great life, a full life, out of bed, no longer vicariously living through the travel channel, but actually getting on an airplane and going and experiencing the world, maybe even becoming a mother. So I decided that I'd give it one more shot, along with a lot of self-acceptance, discipline, self-love. I went and I tried everything, and my body responded extremely well to aggressive homeopathic treatments, meditations, special diets, complete lifestyle change. Any alternative form of medicine I explored. Now, I believe in this idea of having a toolbox. We all need a toolbox in life, right? And through my experiences, I have gained some of the coolest tools. I believe. A lot of them are for free. They include visualizing. Myself well and healed and healthy and strong. Written exercises such as written intentions and focus wheels, adapted from Abraham Hicks, adapted by Sheila Bath. I write about these in my book and on my website. Special diets and juices and tonics to help lower inflammation. Different diets. Understanding. That the most important element to dealing with this monster of a disease and managing a chronic disease that will always probably be in me is that I not only have to keep myself physically balanced, but also mentally, emotionally, and spiritually balanced. I'm not perfect at it. I go up and down. I remember to. Be forgiving of myself, love myself, take good care of myself, and to say, you know, life's too short. I laugh at myself. I remember that I have an amazing list of friends who have wonderful perspectives on life, who I can call at any time and say, you know, I'm really having a horrible time. I'm I'm kind of falling into self-doubt, and them lifting me back up. I have a wonderful arsenal of healers and doctors and therapists. And I'm sure Mind Body Green can offer us many more tools. So, the main point that I want to emphasize today, and always, is that I'm no longer a victim. I'm a survivor, and I was able to transform from being a victim into a survivor, a healer, and a warrior. Rule number two: Appreciate each moment with Avril Lavigne. Being that this is the first new album in five years, um, five years of that was spent with you having uh, uh, three years of that was spent with you having Lyme disease. Um, how has your outlook on life changed? Um, well, I'm glad I had like as much fun as I did in the past. Like yeah. I used to always like live every day like it was the full like the to the fullest. Like it was my last day. Yeah. So I look back and I'm like, oh, I'm glad. I really embraced my career and just like life, and that was always my approach, and that still is my approach. Yeah. Today, do I look at things differently? Yes and no. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that I appreciate the smaller things and the things that were taken away from me at one point. Yeah. I've come so far, and like when I turn around and look at where I was. As into where I am today, like I fully have my life back, and I'm so appreciative and grateful. And um, I feel like I always was, though, and I always had a really good head on my shoulders, and worked really hard to get to where I was. Like I was just like this chick from a small town in Canada, and I like, got here on my own with like no connections. So I always felt really focused and hardworking. I think, if anything. Just the small things and random things are just so much brighter yeah. now. But I also think that that 
just comes with like life experience. Yeah. Too. And as we grow, mm -hmm. we appreciate different stuff more. Yeah. Um, does it affect your relationships and friendships with people? Does it does it make that difficult? Um, I think like at this point in my life, I just really know who my friends are, mm -hmm. and I like to keep like a close, small group. And um, yeah, I learned a lot about friendships and learning how to like lean on people. Yeah. And um, I just keep good people around me. I don't have, you know, time or energy for anything other than just good, solid people. I know that you said that before too. Um, that you're a fan of Shania, another one of our yeah. Canadian gems. We we spoke to her um, about Lyme, and she said that uh, it affected her vocal cords, and really, she had to get treatment and stuff. Um, and obviously, your voice sounds phenomenal on this album. So, um, did that ever become a concern? Like your singing voice getting affected? Um, I think that. While I was recovering, I had it was the first time I'd ever had real time off. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I was concerned when I would start singing that maybe my voice, because it's a muscle, would be like mm -hmm. not as strong. But you know, I was just really so passionate about the songs. And when I got behind the mic and I sang, I was just so there and so present, just like energetically and spiritually and just like everything. And then like I opened my mouth to sing and I feel like I'm kind of singing better than ever. You are. <laughs> but like you it's are. like it's everything. It's because <laughs> yeah. like I'm just so um I'm so in love with music mm -hmm. all over again. Mm. I'm not doing it because I have to. I'm writing music and recording and performing because I want to and because there is a love for it and like through this entire experience of like getting sick and going down and not being sure whether I was going to be making music or not and like coming turning to music really showed me how much I really do love it and need it in my life. Rule number three, don't give up with Justin Bieber. I realized uh, after a series of tests that I have what's called Lyme disease, which is a super silent disease that's not really um, very well known. Um, doctors, it's very hard for doctors to test for it. Basically, infections have uh, played a big part in my acne um, and my uh, overall toxins in my body, which just creates all this stuff. So it feels good now to know why I feel so crappy all the time. Life is worth living. And if you're not going to give up, then the only thing to do is to push forward. That's it. Rule number four, share your struggles with Tori Piskin. I'm Tori Piskin. I do stand-up. I make videos. I have a podcast. I have Lyme disease. In my senior year of college, I was having blurry vision. I was sleeping like 14 hours a day. Like it felt like the exorcist, like the devil was inside of me. Something was just off. I just felt it. I remember getting the diagnosis, telling my friend across the street, it's Lyme disease. And then she was like, oh, my dad had it four times. You're going to be fine. And I just like keep playing that in my head over and over again because it just like really was never fine again. Lyme disease has been one word, hell. I really thought it was just gonna be like a flu or something. I had no idea it was just gonna be this like long health journey. Yeah. I feel like Lyme disease is kind of like that guy you're not in a serious relationship with, but will like come in and out of your life when he just feels needy. Like, up, oh, it's been a month. He texted me. He's tired. He's having headaches. The analogy's going nowhere, but you guys get what I'm saying. Because I feel like it just comes up out of nowhere and I have like no idea when it's gonna happen. I would say fatigue is the biggest symptom I still deal with, but it's not like, oh, okay, I'm getting tired. It literally feels like rocks are on you. When I used to have like a nine to five job, I would go to the bathroom and like put my head on the toilet and then like take a nap. It also has these like awful headaches. It literally feels like someone's in your brain with a hammer like ee, ee, ee. Numbness in the legs, blurry vision. You know when you wake up in the middle of the night and your eyes take a little while to adjust? I was having that throughout the whole day. I think the hardest thing to treat is if you have like neurological symptoms and you don't really know how to describe and you don't know why. When it was really bad, it felt like I was in a scary movie walking around the city. And any moment you feel like something's gonna jump out, that was just like another very weird, specific 
symptom that I was having that I was like, this isn't me. I don't know what the hell's going on. But I think with any autoimmune or anxiety, it's always a constant struggle and you kind of learn how to deal with it. I started making a lot of videos because I got a port put in my arm. And then for the next like eight to nine months, I did IV antibiotics. I was bedridden and that's when I started editing and making all my own videos. I would say it really helped me find another part of my comedy that maybe I would have not found before the Lyme. And then he leaned in, he's like, it's not contagious, is it? And I was like, only for the ones that don't text me back. <laughs> so he has Lyme disease now. No, I've never experienced the symptoms while performing. Even if I'm feeling symptoms before, the moment I get on stage, it like all goes away. I've had shows where I do my Lyme disease jokes and then people will come up to me and they'll be like, oh, I actually have Lyme, I've struggled with that. It's like really nice to hear someone else talk about that. They do call it an invisible disease because you don't look sick. And I feel like when I had the pick line, it was the one time people believed me that I was sick because it was like, oh, this is serious. She has an IV hanging from her arm. Unfortunately, Lyme disease is like very hard to detect. People literally go years thinking it's MS, thinking it's lupus. So I feel so lucky that I got to get the treatment. I'm now freelancing, I'm doing videos, I do comedy, which is great because I really can make my own schedule. If I need to like close my eyes at four o'clock, I can. Everyone has something they deal with. It's okay to say your struggles. I feel like the best way to sign off as someone with Lyme disease is just to be like, signing off. Rule number five, persevere with Shania Twain. You contracted Lyme disease, which had a huge impact on your voice. Was there a moment at which you really thought you wouldn't be able to sing again? There was a long time I thought I would never sing again. I, it took years to get to the bottom of what was affecting my voice. Um, and I would say probably a good seven years before a doctor was able to find out that it was uh, nerve damage to my um, vocal cords directly caused by Lyme's disease. And I was just simply out horseback riding in the forest and got bit by a tick, a Lyme tick. Oh. I mean, that is, it, it, it's funny because, I mean, I am not obviously a world famous singer, but I lost my voice for 18 months and I totally get when I read that you said it's so debilitating, you almost become invisible, don't you, in, in social circumstances, because it's such an effort to speak. When you start avoiding um, speaking on the phone, you start avoiding going to places that have any uh, ambient noise where you have to speak over the volume of others. It, it's very debilitating. Our voice is, is such a huge part of our self-expression. And for a vocalist, a singer, obviously, and for somebody like yourself, it's... Uh, devastating in so many ways. So until I got to the bottom of why I was having a problem with my voice, I, there wasn't really much I could do about it. So it took a long time and I, I did believe that I would have to probably accept at some point that I was never going to be able to sing again. Thankfully, I was, you know, I persevered and it's, I'm making records again and, so, and putting on concerts. So you had um, an operation, didn't you? What did they... Hmm. exactly do and I presume there was a risk attached to that of course uh, it was very scary but the surgeon um, that did the surgery had a cancer uh, throat cancer himself and had this very operation after damaging the nerves in his larynx um, from the cancer operation so it's an open throat surgery they cut you open and they insert uh, Gore-Tex, sort of like what I would consider or explain um, to be crutches. And they stabilize the uh, weakness in the vocal cord function. So apparently I will have these little Gore-Tex crutches supports long after I'm uh, buried in the dust. My voice has changed. My speaking voice is definitely the biggest effort because you can hear I'm, I get quite raspy and um, sometimes the project, I have to adjust, make adjustments um, as I'm speaking. But singing, because there's more projection involved with singing, singing's actually easier. Oh. Um, I have more power when I'm singing now. I... 
I have more character, I find, and I I enjoy singing again. Speaking is the more difficult challenge mm. for me than than singing, which, okay, I'll take that. My family's been so incredibly supportive, and and you know also just through the frustration before I I determined uh, what was wrong with my voice. I was, you know, it, it got me down. I was, um, I, I think that that was the part that needed the most support. Once I was into recovery, um, I was feeling optimistic all of a sudden and feeling a lot better about it. But it was, it, it's been a long road and I've had to rediscover my voice as well and also accept that um, it will never be the same. But I, I, I love my new voice. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. Rule number six. Be hopeful with Yolanda Foster. I went from being an outspoken, multitasking, social butterfly to being trapped in a mentally paralyzed cocoon. Two and a half years ago, I started going to my doctors complaining about exhaustion, joint pain, insomnia, but most importantly, my neurological malfunctions. I often said, it feels like I have an infection in my brain. I felt sick in my head. But unfortunately, my doctor and doctor and doctor after doctor kept telling me I was overworked and juggling too many things at once. Supposedly, my blood work looked normal. So over and over again, I was sent home with more and more prescription drugs like sleeping pills, Adderall, steroids, and of course, the fashionable antidepressant. I was so not depressed. Yes, of course, I was annoyed with feeling stupid and exhausted during the day and dealing with severe insomnia at night. But nevertheless, I was living the best time of my life. By pure discipline, loyalty, and commitment to the show, I managed to finish my season on Bravo TV as a Beverly Hills housewife. <laughs> the last night of filming, I realized that something was really wrong with me. As I was trying to defend myself in an argument with one of the cast members, <laughs> which you know what they're like, <laughs> It wasn't easy, but it did, that moment was a defining moment for me where I realized that I'd gone down. My brain was no longer able to pull information to form sentences. I had no word retrieval, and my memory was blank. And as I answered her, I said, you're such an asshole. And you know, in Holland, in my language, we don't even have that word. We don't even use that. It's a word that I've never used before and probably never will again. <laughs> but um, so it was just that moment, the light had gone off in my brain. And when I finally released myself from being the tough cookie that I am, my body just shut down. My question is, where does one turn when diagnostic testing in the US fails and doctors keep sending people like us home with prescription drugs to mask our symptoms? I ask this question to you, not for me, but for the hundreds and thousands of Lyme sufferers out there that have come to this roadblock. We live in the most extraordinary country with the best doctors in the world, but the truth is, we don't have proper diagnostic testing, and there is no defined treatment protocol or cure for chronic Lyme disease. As hard as this journey has been for me, I feel I was given this experience for a reason. I'm here to represent all my fellow Lymeys. We <laughs> <laughs> we will no longer allow this disease to terrorize our lives. We must break the silence. We must speak up for those who cannot be heard. We must restore hope for those who have given up. And we must share our stories with the world. And rule number seven, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is find the right doctor with Linda Ali. I awakened one morning in 1984 with multiple symptoms that included a stiff neck, 
a temperature of 103, a migraine headache, chills, sore throat. I literally was not able to lift my head off the pillow. I was so ill that my family doctor made a house call and chose to treat me with 10 to 12 days of antibiotics feeling that I had the flu. And the antibiotics did allow me to feel better and resume my normal activities in a normal life until three months later, I began with many, many bizarre symptoms. Continuation of migraine headaches, muscle twitching all over my body, extreme insomnia, uh, fatigue that was unrelenting, um, just a plethora of symptoms that continued to progress. I was finally diagnosed nine years ago with Lyme disease. I saw probably 15 doctors all ending with ologist because my symptoms involved so many systems of my body. I had heart palpitations, um, my eyes were affected, my hearing was affected, my nerves were affected, my joints were affected, my brain, and no one was really able to identify um, exactly what it was, including the head of rheumatology at Hopkins who said she didn't think this was rheumatoid arthritis. And I kept saying that I felt that it was Lyme disease because I have a history of over, probably well over 100 tick infestations from living at our summer cottage in the woods for so many years. But no one thought it was Lyme. In all honesty, because I had a delay in treatment for 20 years, I did not see a significant difference with the antibiotic treatment and symptoms continued to progress. So it was after a long period of time that I chose to stop antibiotic treatment and found a physician who treats more naturally with herbal preparations and it's because I changed the protocol that I am beginning to finally see some improvement in, in the pain and my quality of life. I have a wonderful um, doctor that um, has allowed me to be an active participant in making responsible decisions about my own health and well-being. Um, and again, I, as I stated earlier, I would not go to a doctor that I couldn't have a doctor-patient relationship where I was an equal partner. I have declined some medications that I've been not willing to take the risk, and other times I'm very open and my doctor has just worked with me and listened very closely and honored and respected my wishes. And that's the way that a doctor-patient relationship should be. So finding the right doctor that knows the importance of treating long-term, using different treatment modalities, not just necessarily antibiotics, it is the key to a person's health and well-being. Because had I been treated appropriately and diagnosed early, I would like to believe that I wouldn't have had 14 joint-related surgeries and six total joint replacements. And these surgeries began when I was 40 years old. The only thing that makes sense out of pain and suffering is to be able to find purpose and meaning for your suffering. So when I stopped my nursing career, when I ended it as a parish nurse after 16 years, it wasn't very long until God nudged me and said, you need to start a local support group because we had none in the Harrisburg area. So I was led to start the support group in 2009 and it brought such meaning and purpose. Now I've got a really special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy, but before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week? The science says that when you just watch a video, you get motivated, you get inspired, you have a 35% chance of following through on your goals. 35%, that's not enough, that's not enough just to get motivated. Believe Nation, we're here, you're here. The today matters, you're an action taker. When you commit to a plan of action of when and how you're gonna follow through, when you write it down, you have a 91% chance of following through. And when you commit publicly to somebody else, it jumps to 95% chance. From 30 something percent to 95% chance of you following through. Believe Nation, we need to make this happen. So question of the day, your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action specific for the next week. Put it down in the comments below and I'm gonna show on screen sometime next week to celebrate.
Another side of Daryl you might not know about is he's struggling, despite all that money, with something called Lyme disease, an illness he says you should know about because it could happen to you. How did you find out you had it? Well, you find out you have it if suddenly you're down on the floor is really what it, what's all about. I had some gradual things. I was noticing things like increase in allergic reaction to things, like things I was never allergic to, I suddenly became allergic to, uh, like extreme, like things like celery, of all weird things, you know, I got broke out, my eyes swelled up, all kinds of strange things like that. Uh, I started getting tremors. Uh, I started So get, this came on when? How many years uh, This came on about two and a half years ago. And then one day I woke up and I had this really bad fever. Um, um, I, extreme exhaustion, uh, really stiff all over my whole body. Again, the tremors started. Did they uh, think something like MS well, well, I, or no, neurological? Well, something? that early I didn't know what I had. I, yeah. you know, I went to a couple doctors. I went to the doctor, I, my normal doctor, and he said, well, maybe you have a summer flu, you know, the catch-all summer flu. And uh, I went, well, okay. And then this, but it wasn't going away. And uh, then my uh, ex-girlfriend, Sarah Allen, suggested that maybe I get tested for Lyme's disease, because she's had a bout with Lyme's disease. Right. And, I, uh, and, I, and I did that, and I went online, and I found, uh, uh, I found out, I got a really fast education about it. And I went online uh, because I was told to go to a person named Joseph Burriscano, who is a, what I consider to be an expert in the field, because he's been on the, in the front lines of Lyme disease for and he said, unequivocally, it's Lyme, it's not MS well, or anything else. I read his, right. his, his internet thing, and then I, I, I luckily, I, was, I came back my test. I, I was tested, and I came back with, I had ehrlichiosis, which is one tick-related disease that, that happened to pop up. Uh, then I went to Joe Berriscano, who, who has a practice, had a practice in, in, uh, in the Hamptons, and... Uh, I found out that I was co-infected, and then I actually had four tick-related diseases. Borrelia, Babesia, Babesia is a malaria-like one, Bartonella, which is cat scratch fever. But this is serious stuff. You're, you're, a lot yeah, of people real have Lyme diseases, ah, it's not that no, no, serious. No, no, no. You're this saying, is, this is serious. unaddress what happened. This is serious stuff. I mean, I don't think people really do understand. Now, if, especially if you have what we call chronic Lyme disease, which means if you're co-infected or you've had it for a while. If you get, if you get bit by a tick, you could probably, and, and, and you're lucky enough to have just Lyme's disease, uh, you can go get doxycycline or whatever, and if you can get a doctor to give it to you, and you'll be almost sure to be cured. Your chances are very good. But the thing is that Lyme disease doesn't come up in normal tests. So it's so probably a lot more people have it and don't know it. How about hundreds of thousands of people have it and don't know it? Because, What's the worst it can do to you? Well, it can pretty much kill you. I mean, people have died from it. And if, and, so what do you do? And you if you don't die, medication? you wish you were dead. Yeah, you, you go on long-term medications. So really, how can you go on tours and do all well, the stuff you do? it's hard. I, 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 I was inundating myself with antibiotics, basically. And I, I had six months where I couldn't much do anything. And, uh, and somehow, I don't know, through, through willpower, through good medical whatever, just luck, various things, I got myself back together again, and I'm, and I'm on the road to recovery, and uh, I'm, I'm in pretty good shape right now. Hey guys, what's going on? My name is Nick Carlson. I'm the founder of Vanguard Marketing Group, and I actually help Evan with a lot of his marketing off of YouTube. So things like funnel design and implementation and copywriting and email marketing and launch planning, paid media buying on other platforms other than YouTube and a lot of things of that nature. And Evan asked me to come and film a segment for this video because of the role that Lyme disease has played in my life, how it's affected me, my family, you know, our close friends. And he wanted me to share a little bit about my story and some of my biggest takeaways from dealing with this disease for the last 20 plus years. And so a little bit of a background uh, about me. I, I grew up in Connecticut, which was the epicenter for Lyme. I mean, myself, my entire family, my immediate family, my entire extended family, every friend that I grew up with, we have all contracted Lyme in some form or another. Many of us, thankfully were able to overcome the disease and at least cause it to go dormant but many of us weren't and as a result have been struggling with this disease for 20 plus years as well as all of the various co-infections and other diseases that can be spurred on by Lyme. The person in my life who was who was most most affected by it is my mom. I have been <clears throat> 
her primary caregiver since I was eight years old because she got Lyme disease um, a long, long time ago. And it was, you know, not that it is unfortunately much more researched now, but back then it was, you know, almost no one knew about it. And so she got Lyme disease. It manifested itself as rheumatoid arthritis in, you know, a few joints in her body. And so we went into specialists. They convinced us that it was not Lyme and they told us that it was, you know, just rheumatism. And as a result, they tried to treat the rheumatism and they pumped her full of all kinds of drugs. And as a result, it in actually inflamed the Lyme disease and it, it caused the rheumatism to spread to every joint in her body. Literally, there is not a joint that she is not affected in, affected by. For those of you who don't know, rheumatoid arthritis is a degenerative disease. Um, it essentially tricks your body into thinking, or it tricks your body into attacking itself and essentially deteriorating its joints. It is degenerative. There is no cure. So unfortunately, the longer that you live, the worse it gets. People with with her condition, as severe as she has it, typically don't make it for more than, than five or six years. And thankfully, you know, she is going on 21 years now with it. And for the most part has had, you know, a phenomenal quality of life and has been able to actually be present and witness a lot of things that she wouldn't have otherwise been able to experience, especially with, you know, myself growing up and, you know, family members and, and just things of that nature. And one of the, I, I, I guess I have, I have three primary takeaways or three things that just over the years have really, really stuck out to me as in is majorly important components of overcoming or managing or coping uh, with this disease. And the first one is definitely, and I think someone in this video might have actually mentioned this as well, but it's really imperative that you find the right doctor, that you find the right specialist, because I cannot tell you how many different doctors living in Connecticut, living in California, how many different doctors and specialists that we have gone to see who have known nothing about Lyme disease and who have tried to time and time and time again tell us that it's not possible that it's Lyme disease. It's in that it's, you know, Lyme disease doesn't affect people like this and that they've turned us down. Um, they have they have treated us poorly and they have made it very, very difficult for her to find treatment. It's not their fault. It's unfortunately a very misunderstood disease that doesn't get a lot of exposure. It's one of the things I'm, I'm so thankful for Evan for even putting this video together. But finding the right doctor, somebody who can be empathetic to your situation, who can make sure that they're trying or prescribing the right medications or treatments and because Lyme really does manifest itself so differently in so many different people and you have to find a doctor who is willing to kind of test and and figure out exactly how you're being affected and what will what will exacerbate or inflame the Lyme but also you know what will help deal with the symptoms that it's presenting itself as. Also a doctor who knows what tests to run, what markers to look for. There are very few tests out there right now that are actually designed to be able to even pick this, this disease up. So finding a doctor or a specialist who really, really, really knows his stuff and is willing to really make this long haul with you because it is for some people, again, you can overcome it. For many, this may be a lifetime thing that you're dealing with and you really, really want somebody in your corner. And I'll, I'll tell you, just a little anecdote. I've been to so many doctors with her um, over the last 20 years and I'll never ever forget, we went to um, one pain management specialist at one point and she was obviously in chronic pain and he literally turned his way. He said, I don't believe you have Lyme disease. I'm not gonna prescribe you painkillers. I'm DEA, for, he's a former DEA agent. He said, I'm DEA first, I'm doctor second and I don't trust you or your son and I think you've come in with, a, you know, a lie, like a load, you know, load of, mm. so just if you come up against that, keep going, keep finding them. There are phenomenal people out there. You really just have to try to dig. The second thing is that you really have to be adaptive. With the situation with my mom, again, so many people with her condition don't make it past five years, let alone 21. And every single doctor, every time she's had to go to the hospital, every nurse, every, every, everybody, has always said the exact same thing. I have never dealt with somebody 
in your particular situation. I've never met someone as fragile as you. I've never had to deal with a lot of the the caveats that come with, with this disease. And we have been able to, one of the reasons that she's been able to live and, and, you know, again, with the quality of life for as long as she has for so long is because we've taken so many things into our own hands and we've created all kinds of adaptive measures and different things that just make life easier for us that no one's ever seen before from different ways that she's able to get food in and out of bed, different ways to be able to turn her lights and television on and change the channel and go to the bathroom and see people or talk to people or use, you know, smartphones and devices and things like that. And we've come up with very unique and innovative ways to adapt to the disease as it progresses that has allowed her to still participate in a lot of things that, that many people in her position or condition can't anymore. And so being adaptive to the disease and what happens um, as it progresses is really, really important. And then the third one is, which may sound cliche or may sound, you know, like, duh, just don't give up on them. Really, that is the one of the saddest things that I've seen over the years, and that's that family members and friends, while they mean really, really well in the beginning, even going to doctor's appointments and, and, and visiting and, and, and seeing things, you know, it's one, hard to deal with being constantly told that you're not sick or that you're, there's nothing we can do. And it's also, it can be hard for, you know, the friend or, or whomever or the family member to come and, and see somebody in that condition. And a lot of the time they don't know what to do. And so maybe they just stop showing up for that person or they disappear, or you don't hear from them or they just, again, yeah, they just disappear. And so the biggest thing for people with this disease who are already fighting such an uphill battle of just getting doctors and practitioners to believe in what they're suffering with is is to make sure that you stick with them and make sure that you show them support and help them the best that you can even if you can't do much just calling and saying hey is is huge and just being a support system for them because other otherwise out of experience it does get very lonely very very quick and before you know it you have very few or, or n nobody to turn to. And it's it's really just because people don't understand, understand the disease, how to deal with it, and how to deal with somebody who who is in so much pain all the time and what they're dealing with. So those are my three biggest takeaways from, from having been experiencing this for so, so long. Um, and I'll just, to, to recap, you know, find the right doctor, be as adaptive as humanly possible, and you know, never stop supporting them and, and showing up for them. Thank you guys so much for making it to this part of the video. It means so much to me and so much to everybody who has suffered with this for as long as they have. And, you know, thank you, Evan, again, so much for putting something like this together to bring more awareness to this. So thanks guys. Talk to you soon. If you want to know how you can make ADHD your superpower, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. You can be smart and successful and still struggle with ADD just like I do. My favorite rule is never worry alone. With the, the hyperactive component of ADHD, 